and get started. Hi uh, uh, everyone, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Angie, I'm a developer with ThoughtWorks. I've been working here for one year and uh, I've worked in a couple of industries before, uh, both financial and insurance industry. And we have here with us V. Veronica, um, so I am a designer here in ThoughtWorks. I've uh, worked for ThoughtWorks around two years now, uh, but in industry for a decade and over. Um, so I work uh, financial governments, UK government here in Singapore, um, financial as well, uh, B2B and so on and so forth. So that's us. Shall we start? Thank you everyone for coming. Hope your bellies are full and that you will not fall asleep. Um, quick check. So, so we're just okay. We can shout. <laughs> we can shout. No, no, we can shout. Shout. Oh, you can shout? Yep. Okay. Uh, you want to recite a poem or something? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if you are this, this loud, is it okay? Is this okay? okay. That's okay? Yeah. All right. Can we please ask the people in the kitchen to be considerate? <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Um, so thanks for coming and, and let's go to that. So I see that we've triggered the good words um, that lots of people came up, which is beautiful. Um, so what we want to talk about is how to build a scalable product. And then um, this has been triggered because I have, uh, we've been recently on a project where a client has uh, six digital products. We had a 10 months deadline. Uh, so we throw in four designers, we have developers uh, here in Singapore and abroad we had to communicate with. And um, the interesting thing about this, this project was that the product we were developing was supposed to be white labeled. White labeled means that they take it and then they apply different branding on, the, on, the, on those six products that they are rolling out. Now, we were obviously working in agile environment and we were scratching our heads on like, how can we make this scalable, how can we make this fast? How can we work with changes? Um, and we identified kind of three items that um, are very crucial in order for us to succeed. Um, and this is what we're gonna be talking about today. So the idea there is that um, these three items, sorry, can I, yeah, thank you, um, are something that are very much on the ground. It's about the designers and it's about the developers. So, <coughs> Let's go to the first one, the grids. So for the purpose of this exercise, um, imagine that Mountain Dew, which is the soda, uh, has basically um, uh, tasked you to create a login page. And then the login is for the new product, which is called Diabetes. Diabetes is actually, <laughs> okay, Mountain Dew actually in 2012 created a campaign and asked people how would they name a new soda and this was the name that came up on the top. That's actually a real story. So we are going to, they never did it, obviously. <laughs> but this is it. So we have a login page, right? And then <coughs> what happens is the designer goes and says, OK, so I'm going to design, da, 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 design the stuff. And then developer sits and then measures all the distances and all the measurements. Um, and they develop. But what happens when it grows a bit more complex, right? The developers are pulling their heads. Um, designers are creating this design systems to remember how, what were the measurements they applied on some different place, uh, and then they are to make sure that they can apply all these rules constantly in the future, in the future UI. And then the developers either keep measuring, or poor souls will have to learn the design system that the de designers developed, which we can't even keep up to date anyway. So the idea is that uh, we apply simple grids. It's a very simple solution to a, a problem where you, have, where you have to be focused on your speed and your scalability. So basically, what does it do to designers? It saves us time. I have a blank sheet of paper. I need to place an element on it. I have a boundaries. I already have some guide rails, right? Um, someone has called it that it's like invisible glue. You have elements on the page, and then grid gives you a, a nice way how to string these things together and create the rhythm so the person knows where to look and, and what to, um, where, are the, where, where, where to expect things to be. Um, the beautiful outcome when it comes to scalable products is that 
you have unified UI across all the products. So for developers, they can stop measuring painstakingly, painstak okay, that word, <laughs> all the pixels. Uh, and they can just focus on placing the elements within columns. So this belongs to column three columns, this belongs to four columns, seven columns. They don't actually go into the detail. Um, again, and the outcome is simpler and cleaner code. Um, so let's have a look. I want to give you some practical examples. So for example, I picked uh, a grid that is the whole page grid, and it's a full width. Who does that, for example, if you go Google Maps, they place this drawer into four columns, right? Very simple example. Um, or if you were to look into a, uh, this is the most common grid used, you see all <coughs> everywhere on the internet. Um, like today's talk, elements are placed within it. So it's a very, very simple way of using elements. And then developers don't have to go all crazy on this. So over to you. Thank you. So, um, in the perspective of a developer, we want to move away from measuring things, as he has mentioned, and we want to just know where the element should be put. So, in using Grid, we are able to make it more maintainable in terms of code, because we are able to put semantics in code. We are able to say that this is supposed to occupy certain columns instead of having some magic numbers in our fading <coughs> and margin. So, um, we are basically letting the UI libraries calculate all this numbers for us and we are just basically given instruction of, of how it should look like. Um, so the benefits is obviously in terms of communication from developers and designers, we are able to communicate better, we have the same language and also even between developers, whenever you pick up a new code, you are able to make sense of how this code, this code supposed to look like in a layout instead of like checking in what are the paddings that is applied in an element. So um, basically, it helps us in terms of code readability and maintainability. So uh, the question now is, how do we actually use Grid Layout? So there are a lot of UI libraries that are out there and already have their own implementation of Grid Layouts. Some examples are Bootstrap and Material UI. Those are like famous UI libraries that have Grid implementation. But basically, they boil down to the same uh, concept and they usually use derive all these libraries from uh, the same CSS flex box and uh, actually now CSS already supports their own grid layout as well so for the purpose of this talk we are going to start simple we're going to start from making a page with one h1 element one input box element and one submit button element so uh, the first thing that we need to set up is to make sure that all the grid layout is covered uh, under grid. So we should set up display grid. Um, as well as we need to set up how many columns you want it to be applied inside a grid. For instance, uh, a typical number of columns that we use in designers and developers is 12 columns. I'm just going to pause for a second. So typically we have 12 columns, so here uh, I specified, um, so this syntax repeat 12, it just means that we want to repeat 1fr 12 times, so we're stating that we want to have 12 columns, and also for 1fr, it's a kind of a relatively new CSS syntax that says that we just want this one page to be divided by 12, and each of the 12 things have the same proportion. So it is a way for us to set up these 12 columns. And the last thing that we need to set up is to specify what is the column gap. In this case, we specify page <coughs> to be 20 pixels. Um, in other kind of speak, sometimes you also refer to this gap um, in designer language or some of the UI libraries language as gutter. Um, so the next thing that we need to do is uh, to basically place where are the, con where are the position that we want an element to be placed at. So in this case, for this H1 text, I specified it to uh, start from column three, and we want the column to end before column 11. So it starts from here to here. The next important concept that we need to know about um, grid layout is also it can be used either for positioning and for sizing of the element itself. So for instance, in this uh, input box element, 
we are using uh, the grid layout basically for positioning. So we are using grid column start 5, so it will start from this position to grid, grid 9, so it will end, so basically the element will occupy this position, but then we are still fixing the size of the element itself. Um, but then also we can use the flex layout to actually um, determine the size of the element by basically saying that this this button should start from grid 5 to grid 9. So the whole element actually stretches for and occupies the whole um, distance that we specified. Cool. cool. So let's still maximize what we can do with grids. Um, and we actually can start putting the grids inside the elements themselves. Again, for the same purposes for designers ease as well as for the developers. Uh, so here's an example. Diabetes has his own shopping website where you can buy lots of diabetes. And then you can use that, for example, if you have card like that, you can define a grid that has a wider padding a margin on the sides and a different size to gutter, for example, to this. So this card is a bit smaller, so from visual perspective, what do you want? You want the margin bit, a bit narrower here. So you can go around and play with the grids. You can also use it on a little bit more complex things, like, for example, it's a page, it's a, it's a let's say, card, which has two columns of a content inside. This helps if you say this is within seven columns. When the text bleeds, it bleeds over here. So it really simplifies lots of things for us. Um, over to you. Right. Uh, in terms of before for implementation, what we want to understand about having component grid is that we just need to place the grid container on the elements that we wa that want to follow the grid layout. But the rest of elements that raise outside of the layout can be styled independently of the grid layouts. Okay, any questions about grids? Yes. Uh, no, it's uh, it's coming with CSS three. Yes, CSS grid layout. They are just uh, releasing it early this year, and they are still making some tweaks. But you can basically use it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Can CSS grid completely replace like the strap grid or other things? Well, it depends on what completely replace uh, means. Uh, I mean, like, there are uh, certainly a lot of advantage of using a pre-made library such as Bootstrap. You can have a lot of other styling uh, that is already made inside Bootstrap, but the, for the purpose of layouts, grid layouts in specific, um, you kind of have the same functionality by just using CSS grid layouts. But depending on the use case that you have, depending on the kind of styling that your um, client wants you to use, it is very a judgment call on that. So what do you code for mobile stuff? Right. Is it a matter of just giving it more parts or? Yes, so uh, basically that's also another advantage of using grid layouts. So uh, we still kind of use media query for CSS grid layout to actually adjust like for instance, for the bigger screen, you can adjust it to occupy five columns, and so smaller screen, you can uh, occupy a larger number of columns so that the size will fit better. But then, um, also, uh, like in CSS grid layout, uh, if you are using a plain CSS, you can reuse media query. In other types of libraries, such as I think Bootstrap have their own implementation of breakpoints that uh, enables you to like kind of not use media query directly. So there are, there are a certain abstraction benefit that you can have by using um, UI libraries compared to like CSS. <laughs> yeah. For example, in the yeah. container, um, component, you have two props that say you start from column five yeah. and column nine. Mm -hmm. So that's the way. Yes. So if, if you want to do it for mobile, which starts with one and then with 12, mm -hmm. is it a matter of adding two more props that says mobile start? Yeah, you can basically uh, just a matter of saying that you just call a media query saying that from uh, screen size of this, you want the column size to actually use these other properties instead of the properties. So you override that properties with whatever properties you set inside the media query. 
Cool. Any more questions? Are we all excited to move on? <laughs> components. Um, so components are fun. Um, imagine that you are creating your diabetes account um, and you are the developer there. And then um, we have just launched a new feature, which is single sign-on, right? And then they come say, hey, we need a new button. Like, OK. So a designer goes and creates a new button. And then imagine that diabetes grows and grows and grows. And then you end up with something like this. This is very common with uh, products that grow and grow. Um, so you've got lots of styles, lots of colors, lots of buttons, lots of shapes. And then you start going crazy again. And this is OK, because the world is this. The world is complex. Things grow. Changes come. Uh, and we need to deal with that. Um, and design changes. And design changes, and it's OK. And here I just listed a couple of reasons why as a developer, you get a new screen, say, oh my god, design changed it again. So one reason is, for example, for optimization. Um, in one of our projects, we created a uh, it was mobile app, and we had a had to do list where you would have a check box, as in like single select list. And then as we grew, we have found out that we have a screen where we have to have a single select list as, as well as multi-select. And they would have to be on the same screen. It was a filters page. And then we realized that checkboxes are usually on the right-hand side, but we had our ticks on the left-hand side for the single select, so we had to move the tick to the right-hand side so it doesn't look silly. And that's optimizing, right? We have learned something new and we need to change that. Um, second, the hypo hypothesis can, can be wrong, which is absolutely fine. Again, uh, we thought that big red button would make people click on it. After research, we found out that people are scared of big red buttons, so they don't click on it. Um, or styles are not enough. So we designed a drop down for uh, one, two, three words items. And then as we go along, we had to put an entire address into a drop down. So we had to do multi lines and so on and so forth. Um, and requirements changed. So, for example, we were doing checkout flow in a shop, and they wanted to do the entire checkout flow that you redeem your points that you have collected. And then the business, because the financial model wasn't ready, remove that requirement and we had to redesign the design flow uh, the checkout flow with the checkout with the credit card so things happen and they come out as a design change now the solution to that is components and you keep saying that components are no new no, nothing new to to developers uh, but they are very useful when you are talking about scalable pro products um, how they work is basically as you are working through designing designing your product um, and you start spotting things that repeat themselves, right? Simplest is a button. So what you do is you turn it into a component. Now, um, it can be a button. It can be more complex like uh, dividers, icons, and input fields, and, and error messages, and things like that, accordions, all the way to entire pages. And so what you can do is that if I create a parent button and then I change the color, it triggers down in all of the child components. It's very simple. The beautiful advantage, and for especially for scalable products, is that we have a uh, fast change across, if necessary. We go to one place. Imagine I have six products. Each of these products has 30 pages or 30 screens, and I have to go one by one to change it. Nonsense, right? And you have consistent user experience. So. How would you use components, and what are the guidelines to actually create components? So, from users' perspective, what we want we want them to be we want to be consistent. Buttons are always this shape, right? Buttons that have an arrow take me outside of this application. Uh, we want them to be structured, so make them in inherited as many styles as possible. For example, if we decide that we want to change the font in the entire application, I don't have to go one by one. I just go change the body font, and they should reflect in my entire application. And they should be reusable. And usability is only about how well you document it. And I'm not talking about writing Word documents and functional specifications. It's about document them well. Designers have their own design li systems, design libraries, whatever works for you for that specific project, as well as for developers, you have your own systems. It's a very good investment for the long run. Right, so we've come to why we do components in development. Obviously, in the past few years, um, there is a big rise in component-based front-end frameworks like React and Vue.js. 
there is a very good reason why that happened because of course there is this principle in development that do not repeat yourself. We do not want to always create duplication in code. We want code that is maintainable and we want code that is able to be reused in different cases. And uh, we hope that by uh, doing certain things to make components, we are able to actually decouple functionality and styling so that the components would be reusable. So um, the first thing that we need to understand about building generic components is to understand that we want to build components that is basically reusable. It means that our sole purpose of building them is to maximize reusability. And um, in a more specific definition of that is that we want to try as much as possible to decouple the position arrangement of a component in the layout and how the component in itself is styled and the functionality of the component. So um, the smallest building blocks that uh, we can think about is what uh, we call building blocks, which is basically uh, the smallest abstraction that we can find, which are common patterns that we usually use in codes. For instance, there is this uh, flex component, which is basically just a normal div that is default to use flex box uh, and flex wrap. So because we see a lot of these same patterns happening in our code, we'll try to just extract this and make a <coughs> building blocks out of it. Uh, the next, uh, a slightly bigger type of components is what, is what we call basic components, which is basically a typically um, smaller components such as your buttons, your input fields, your text, which have um, all the functionality being able to be customized from the outside but you will make sure that uh, there are also some default values that you can put inside so that it can be reused easily and be built uh, in, can be reused to build uh, bigger components. And the next type of components is what we have uh, as uh, composite components, which are basically a, a kind of a bigger scale, scale components that is composed out of basic components. For instance, we have this list picker which is basically just containing one title text and a lot of list items according to how many list items you want to pass into this component. The idea of having different tier of components is that such that we can <coughs> basically um, have differing sizes that we can use as building blocks to make a bigger component. And uh, the differences between those are just in terms of how much customization we can do with them. Uh, how much functionality they have on its own, and of course, how much reusability they have on its own. So, uh, obviously, we have common components. We also have custom components that can be becoming uh, extracted out of a layout because it's reused in many pages, for instance. Um, and b basically, usually, it's reused within a module of a project. <coughs> so, those components, uh, they are like very differing sizes of those kind of custom components. Uh, let's take the example of this small title text component, which is basically just a text, but we specify the positional uh, styling of it, and we specify a typographical styling that we want to apply to it. So basically, the idea is the only thing that can be customized from this custom component is only the content. But the rest of the styling is kind of already fixed within the component itself. Um, in terms of how usually, typically, we structure our components, uh, we usually have a common <coughs> directory where all our other common components are stayed in. Uh, and we also have different directory which typically is um, named after the page layout or the modules, which have all the components that is used only solely for that component, oh, sorry, I mean modules or layout. All right, fun stuff. So um, basically, this pyramid represents um, the ideal scenario on how we should have a number of custom components, composite components, and building blocks, and basic components. Ideally, we should have as much building blocks and basic components as possible so that we can reuse it and build a bigger components. And uh, we should have the least number of custom components. The reason of having this basic level of thumb is because we want as much as possible to reuse it 
which will help us in the long run in terms of maintaining the code, in terms of um, make, like having a sense of security that if there are changes coming in, we are able to quickly change that in just one place and not having to hunt for each of the components in different sections. Having the security that if um, there is bug to hunt, we can easily hunt it in one component instead of having duplication in all our codes. This also means that um, there are technical debts associated with stylings. So um, basically, if you have many duplication, you find the pain not in the short term when we are doing it, but in the long run. It's also true that building custom component, uh, customized component, like your small building blocks, is very heavy because you need to spend a lot of time to make sure that these components are able to be customized for other different scenarios. But it is definitely a worth investment that we can spend in the beginning of the project. It is generally difficult to make um, customizable components. Basically, there are, are things that are very obviously like basic components, like, such as your buttons, your checkboxes. But sometimes, like when you are implementing a page, it's difficult for you to know which are the components you should extract and uh, make into a custom, uh, sorry, I mean a common component. And sometimes that discussion happens with your designers. But uh, we should, as a developer, try our best to find patterns to see what are the duplication coming in, to see what are the stories coming up, and kind of see how these components can be reused before. And it is kind of our responsibility as well to try to push down uh, and refactor the code as much as possible to push it down from a uh, custom components level down to like composite or basic components level. Mm. So um, in terms of, so just now Fee mentioned about how in designers usually have a design system or a style guide. Usually um, developers typically didn't, do not have a style guide, but uh, in recent years there is a rise of <coughs> style guide for developers. These are just two examples of style guides uh, used typically in React projects. So uh, the idea of it is to give visibility for the, for the whole team or whoever uh, new members joining into the team of the existing components that we have. So it's a, a good way, an automated way to kind of um, document all your common components so that everyone who joined the team will know what are the existing components. Again, then they do not need to kind of build that from scratch and they are able to kind of use the component and run with it. So, any questions for the component section? <laughs> what is the, like, kind of the most the practical, largest scope for a component library, right? So, for example, do you guys have at ThoughtWorks a base component library that all the projects use, and then you sort of refine it from there? Or is that too big? Or is it kind of every time a project starts, you guys start with a, a base set of components and, you know, and kind of recreate that? So, I mean, what is, the, like, if you come... Obviously, the more generic you get, the harder it is to manage, right? Um, from development perspective, it really depends on it really depends on the project. There are projects that are obviously very small, and it's not worth the investment to build the components at that point of time. And there are also even a bigger projects that there is just um, a lot of pressure in terms of um, showing up the functionality that you may be able to kind of pause and not do. Um, kind of um, component customize all these components in the very beginning, but if we know that this is obviously a very uh, project that needs a lot of scalability, then it really is worth it to really spend time to think about what kind of components we can break down and kind of put it aside. And it's also a lot of discussion with the designers because designers would be the people who know best what are the components they are going to reuse. Um, Obviously, there are functionality components that is more of development based, but usually it's kind of um, depending on case by case basis. Usually, we will start from very basic components that we know obviously will be we use all the time. Such as that's why the basic components come in because we know like things like button, things like input boxes. There are things that is always going to be used. Things like the building blocks like flex. There are things that are going to be used. So. And it's quite easy to set it up, so why not set those up first? 
but the rest of the components is very on whether we s we are because we are in we are working in an agile environment and changes happen of all the time, so it's a balance of knowing, um, trying to predict what will change and kind of trying to also balance the technical debt of it and like whether we want to do it now or we want whether we want to do it in the next iteration, whatever makes sense. I think the you you should never have bigger design system than your product is, and I think that's the biggest problem if if you inherit something. So you should your your component library should contain only the things that you actually need, right? So we on the previous project the client had already existing style guide, and as in coded on a from from a co from a code perspective as well as design perspective, and then we are thinking should we take this, and then we are thinking more towards materials. So we said should we use the material, and then the developers it was developers discussion only. They say, you know what, let's not, because then we will have to override and override and it will get all messy. And then you designers don't even know if you're going to be using these components and we're already kind of implementing them and making sure everything works. So it was a work upfront, which you never want to do. So that was on the, this, this was on the last, last project we were on. Yeah. So every project essentially, or every product anyway, has its own design system as a role. And that means, okay, so does, does that mean that you come up with that system from scratch? Or do you have system templates that you can, I mean, clearly from project to project, or product to product, there's going to be commonalities. You don't want to. Yeah, everyone has a button, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> everyone yeah, has an input exactly field. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, so where does the, where do you draw the line there, right? That, that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Right? It's not easy. Okay. It really depends. It really depends. But the rule of thumb is to not inherit something bigger than you need. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Components. No? Okay, I'm, I have one. Uh, because we did this talk before already, and some people ask, and this is a very, very good question. So they asked um, how to ensure that our project team actually adds the, uh, adds the components into the library because we have no time, right? Because creating components is for long run. Uh, and no one has time to go and make sure that the component exists and is in the common place. And then my story is supposed to was estimated that it's going to take me this much time or this much effort. And, but I didn't accommodate for actually making it into the common components and so forth. So on other projects, how we've done it is that we would actually create like a technical task, which is create a component of input field. Um, and once that's done, only then we would play a story that is implement this component into this place. So there is a one way how you can actually manage it and make sure that because maintenance and diligence about maintaining your design system is obviously the hardest thing, right? Um, so this was a mechanism we put in place in order for it to happen. Cool, let's move on. Hey. Um, how do you actually start from designing a component that's supposed to be usable? Because, uh, okay, okay, um, my question is more, more about um, you build the basic components like a separate, separate task in like sort of like an isolated process, or does it coexist with an existing requirement to go hand in hand? And how do you make sure that there is reusability and the component and there are change, uh, the change the the process is subject to change, right? So how do you accommodate for that? So you start with the fact that. Um, you start creating the login page first. You don't start, this is my own personal opinion, guys, yeah? So everyone is like the atomic design, right? Some people go from top, some from bottom. <laughs> the, the way I found it working really well is that you create your login page, and then you have the individual things in there, right? The buttons, the input fields, the header, things like that. And then you create another page where also has the input fields. And then you're like, oh, so input fields are already, I've used them twice. It's a good time to create it into a component, right? And then you keep creating new, new, and new. And then suddenly you know that your input fields can no longer be 100% width because we need to have two input fields next to each other for mobile phone, for example, right? So what you do then is that you iterate. So this is new requirement. It's a change, right? And you say, OK, so this no longer suffice. And that's why the design changes. And that's why we then go and refactor our components and change them however we needed to. And we change. So this will be happening, and it's OK. But that's why it is so risky to design something up front unless you actually have a use case for it, right? So as you go, it's more of it worked better when it's more of reflection rather than trying to predict the future that will change anyway. Yeah. So 
Uh, for instance, there is actually a, a real scenario that happened a couple of weeks ago where we are trying to implement um, kind of a model that is used in two different pages. But uh, basically, the model are uh, the same kind of design, but have different content and different, uh, slightly different functionality inside. So uh, because we are going to play out this story in the kind of a same iteration, so what we decided is for, um, for one, one pair or one, one uh, stream of work to actually uh, include that building of the common component inside a story and build that first. And when that story is done, when that uh, common component is ready, then the, the next person can reuse that component. So we make sure that we do not want to also build if we already know like uh, the distant future of knowing that this is definitely going to be used uh, like in a week. We don't want to just build a custom component for this obviously. So mm -hmm. we'll start from building a common component and then we just give it to the next person to kind of build the custom component for it. Mm. But okay, uh, sometimes what happens is when, when you do that, you have your business of the requirements sort of leak into the the common share component properties. Mm. How do you make sure that? And I'm sure it will happen. But how do you refactor it again that so that for the next requirement you, you don't break stuff when you make change make, when you make new changes mm. to the so design have a solution for that, but it's about working software. So, um, in, 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 so in a design software, we have already tools that maintain this, that can solve this, right? Figma, Sketch, all this you guys know, but yeah. So, um, hmm, that's a, a tough question, honestly. It's, it's kind of, um, I think as a developer, we have never going to see a perfect code. We, we won't be able to see like a nice pyramid of like, <laughs> oh, this is all our common components and all very minimal custom components. There is always a continuous refactoring of our code and it is kind of expected that uh, some, some of our code um, <coughs> um, may not be like backward compatible at some point of time. So it's also like sometimes a judgment call in terms of like whether you want to build another custom component for it or you can kind of try to change it if you see that this is still reusable you kind of like push it down the pyramid more and make it more customizable that that it can be reused for another use case mm. so it's more of a judgment from, from experience yeah cool cool any more questions what I'm trying to understand is, suppose I, I use a material UI, uh, which is entirely a, a component framework, which is mapped to a React uh, library. And what components are we referring here? Is it a combination of uh, those material UI? Say I have roughly 500 components from, from the React library available to me. But are we saying are we that these components are developed independent to those 500 components, or a wrapping up of some components, or, or how is it like? It can what, be is, what are these components uh, talking about? It can be uh, composed on top of that components. So basically, let's say Metaway UI already have certain stylings inside. So we can override those stylings uh, to meet the specification that we have uh, from our client. Cool. Any more questions? You guys are on fire today. Uh, do you have someone who is in charge of this assistant? If yes. Yeah, mm. that's a very good question. Um, so, from other projects, and this is a question that is like, how do you make sure design system stays up to date and is followed and maintained, and and how do we know? So, currently on the project, there is four designers, um, and we are all in charge of certain functionality. Uh, so we put a couple of things in a place in order for us to stay in sync. Uh, so we have daily XD huddle where we will just say, I'm working on this, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. Hey, you're using component that I'm about to use as well. Make sure that this scenario is included in that so we don't clash and so on and so forth. So right now it's a bit more of we sit next to each other so we can talk to each other. We are not, this is not, it's not that big. I've heard on, uh, I heard about projects where it's over 70 designers and this is quite impossible. Um, what they do is they create a whole structure, like Agile has all of these rituals, they've created a similar thing. 
So yes, there is owner. That owner is involved on a product level because they need to foresee future and reflect and understand business requirements. They create all the way to they send out a newsletter to the entire dev team to say, hey, we've finalized a new component. This is how it's being used. These are all the interactions. And they actually talk about it. It's about communication a lot. Um, then they have, for example, they have a tough component they've created and then they do a Q&A. So they call all the designers once a week and they say, this is one, can you please break it? Do you have a scenarios where you think it will not work and so on and so forth? So there are a couple of things that are put in place in order for this to work basically and to make sure that it's maintained and, and, and distributed correctly. Yeah. Um, Specifically, is there a ritual when maybe someone is overlooking everyone else So are you talking super the supervisor supervising designers or developers? <coughs> designers. Um, so currently in the project, I have developers doing that to me, which is great. So I forgot to create something as a component. They're like, hey, you are creating new stuff, but we already have it. And they actually bounce it back to me. And I'm like, oh, sorry, guys, thank you. So I think it's everyone's responsibility to be on top of the game. But in the same way, it's the owners of the design system responsibility to make sure that these people know about the components. And it doesn't work if either of them are doing their job. Um, reviewing people's design, uh, we are trying not to do that. Um, and if so, then we would, it's more about enabling the person to be able to keep an eye on those kind of things rather than checking if they are doing everything up to scratch because that's not scalable. Yeah. So I think one point that is good to put across is that um, we've talked about all this style guide, um, like style guide for developers, we've talked about how to make components small, but nothing really beats communication in the end of the day. Like mm. you, you need to still have like that active communication between developers and designers within developers team. Like uh, because like especially in agile environment, like requirement changes all the time. Like one day you are building this component and the next day the next the other stream across your table are building the same component. So if you don't have that communication, there is there is no way of you being able to already finish the component and already document it nicely for them to see. So in the end of the day, it's always about also communicating what's out there already and uh, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, even yeah, like from the basic component in terms of like knowing mm -hmm. what's components out there. Um, it's like managing stakeholders. If you involve them in the creation of it, they're more likely to adopt it as well. So it's good to have the people, have the developers creating the component with you and brainstorming about how it should work and what it should be doing as well as anyone else. In. Cool. Any more questions? So basically when you're trying to design <coughs> something, are you saying like, for example, I have this page, do you, specific, do you say like, okay, so I have this element in the page, so this is actually component A, B, C, and that's how you pass it to the designer so that they know that, oh, so this one's actually an existing component already that, mm -hmm. so that, that they use? Or like, how do you guys like pass on, like for example, you have a single page, pass it on to the, uh, to the developers, and how do they know that this is an existing component that they have to create a new component for it? Cool. So that's a very good question. We had a, so we have a kickoff of stories. So before developer picks up a story, uh, designer, BA and QA, everyone will come there and then we will talk through the story. And then this designers, it's designers responsibility to point out all the components. So I say, this is a component, this is a component. I know this team has built it, go and talk to those guys, this is component. Uh, also some of the tools, for example, I, comp I create uh, components from my typography as well. So these are styles and then follow that, it's a component. Um, I uh, make sure that actually in, uh, we are using Figma, Figma on this project and you can actually hover over and see that it is component style number da, da, da. So actually the developers can do it themselves as well. Yeah. Cool. Any more? Awesome. Design systems and components are a popular topic. Okay. Last one, typography. Okay, let's carry on with our imaginative story. Imagine that, uh, and I'm not trying to be morbid here, but imagine that you are blind, right? And then you have landed on this diabetes page, login page. Everyone think about it. What is the most important information on this page? 
Everyone in your head, what is the most important information? Get it? OK. You land it on a page, and then it will, if you will have assistive technology, it will read out into your ear, create your diabetes account. You're like, OK, I'm in the right place, right? So how, what would be the uh, HTML element? Anyone, shout. Well done. OK. Now, um, this happens. Sorry, the username Google was my idea is already taken. Choose another one. OK. So what is the most important information now? The warning, right? So what would be the HTML tag? H2. H2? OK, assistive technology will first read this and then read that. But that's no longer the most important information on the page, is it? So with HTML5, we can also call it H1. And now we have a problem because we have different font sizes for the HTML element H1, right? Um, the solution to that is actually something called typographic scale. It's essentially a list of font styles uh, that are named, but the names are not HTML element names. So Google uses it, Airbnb, and everyone who has more complex projects or products, they will figure out very soon that calling H1, att uh, attaching a style to H1 is not scalable because those kind of situations will start happening that I showed you before. So if you look at the names, it's called headline. It's not called body text. It's called subhead, display one, display two, display three, or title one. You can name it. I know projects where they call it crocodile, mouse, giraffe, whatever. Whatever works for your team, right? And the idea is that how, how would you make it happen is that a designer goes and creates a scale. Scale is like a, they, this, this very smart man said it's like a musical scale. It's a basically um, based on numbers or humans function in a beautiful pattern. So based on numbers, you create your scale from smallest to the biggest. And then what you do, you assign a style to it. So these are your styles. And you name them giraffe, crocodile, dinosaur, and you go on. And what you can do, you can go crazy with them. You can link the HTML elements to whatever style you want, need, and your product that is growing crazy is requiring. So it's a very simple thing. What we are doing here is we are deca decoupling HTML elements from the styling. And now we'll tell you how. <laughs> so um, traditionally, we have styling in the HTML element itself. So let's say H1 have this styling, H2 have this styling, and we have classes that overlap those styling. So this idea is to decouple the HTML structure and styling. We are, with applying this area, we are able to avoid those CSS overwrite being held. We are able to kind of put it clearly all our typographic scaling and styling in one places. And then according to the style that is needed, we just apply them. Any questions? No. OK. I have one for you. So sorry, just the, the concept here is to basically override the um, actual HTML tags, so the styles. Basically, we don't want any styling to be applied in the HTML element. We just want create classes, to create basically. classes that put the typographic scaling there. So in the old days, you will say H1 is font, style, font, font size 16 and it's bold. Right? That's how we used to design and code. But the idea is that you remove that, because then those, that problem that I have showed you would not be solved. And you, will, you will restrict yourself to those styles that you've created, or you will have to start overwriting like crazy. OK, so fundamentally, you are abandoning use of the HTML tag. For styling. For styling. Does it make sense? Sort of. <laughs> Sure. Back, back to the previous problem about uh, yeah, the element. Yeah, so here, what would you use for as the as the HTML tags for the the create your account and the elements? What tags would you use? H1. What H1? Yeah. Just that uh, create your account should be uh, bigger, a, a smaller font size. Yeah. So that the accessibility. To yes. Really pick up that as to exactly. So it was probably a bit too fast. We went because we went through this so many times. <laughs> so it's a very good point. Exactly. 
Any more questions? So when I presented this, because uh, I was actually presenting this to my internal teams, because we were restructuring completely the code, because it, we were not fast enough, basically. And we were not meeting all the needs that we, we, we had to for the product, because the product was growing crazy, right? Six products. And then this lady came to me and she said, so why don't you make everything H1? And they just assign different styles to it, right? I mean, that's developers thinking. <laughs> I like that. And I was like, oh, my, this is too smart for me again. So the reason for that is, um, one is the accessibility tools. So if you have assistive technology, there will be absolutely no hierarchy of the information that you are reading, right? It will read everything one by one by one. And that's not necessarily what you want to do. Imagine you have a, a blog post and it has a subsections, right? Even we read without assistive technology just the headings first, and then we decide what we want to read next. And that's how it should be also. And that's what we attract. That's the assistive technology is trying to replicate for the people who can't see. So that's why it is important to actually create those H1, H2, and H3s, and so on and so forth. There is actually one more reason, uh, and it's SEO. So it no longer actually tags are no longer as important in SEO as they used to be, the HTML elements. But um, they still Google here and there comes up with these things. And this is purely based on the fact that they go in, read the H1, which is this one, and then pulls out all the H2s. So it does have its advantages. Yeah. I see lots of people thinking. That's very good. Any questions? I think we are not targeting for the people who cannot see. Uh, we don't see any other reason why we go for typography, right? Because H1 gives us the font size and the bold, and we are overriding both of them. Then why not? We don't use H1 at all. So if you go back to that, that scenario, The users are not, uh, we are not making a user friendly website where people who can't see uh, would not be able to guess. So you would say, let's say this would be H6, for example, and this would be H1? Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. Even overriding the typography, you don't use okay. anything like user paragraph or user base. Yeah. Definitely. You feel free to write. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what we are talking about is scalability, right? So this has its advantages. The moment the product starts rolling out to other countries, right? Like in Europe, uh, AA accessibility is a must. Governments, it's a must, you know, and things like that. So it's something that is very, like, you should be creating user-friendly products here. The biggest disadvantage is SEO. It would pick up the, these error image, error things also there, right? Hmm? The error message, the warning message on the page, if it is H1, SEO will pick up this. I'm not, I don't, I don't know much about SEO, but I, would SEO pick up error messages? Do they crawl? I don't know. Good question. No. Any other? Yes. You know, in terms of typography, <coughs> do you have a system in your system whereby the, you go alongside <coughs> with the ICG for product matching? You know, otherwise it would be fixed up. Because likewise, we say to use like for example, for food product, and you use, for example, Bernini for comfort, and then you use, for example, uh, stencil for certain kind of thing. So do you have that kind of principle in your system that you know identify the kind of the usability in a matchup system? I'm not sure if I understand the question, as in like from design perspective or developer perspective. Uh, so how do we assign the font to the right place? No, in other words, how do you do a matching? Because, you know, the photograph, for example, it, uh, you know, it, it is suitable for certain product line. Corporate, you use but any of times or whatever, not. Mm -hmm. Or some, you know, stabilized stuff you use. Uh, whereas you use some other thing for men for different sort of classification. Mm -hmm. so, so do you have that in the system? I think this is a design decision on the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are trying to avoid uh, multiple fonts and try to figure out which is the best one for that specific product itself, yeah. But it's a, it's a dark magic. <laughs> yeah. But you don't have suitability matching uh, component. Oh, as in, so if I would say in my, I have two products, right? Two digital products and they both have a login page 
And for one product, I would like to use, let's say, Times New Roman. And for another product, I would like to use C Comic Sense, for example. Is that what you mean? That's the override then, right? From the code perspective. Because likewise, when you use body tech, mm. you use Optima, which is neutral. Yep. You know that you know it is it yeah, yeah. easier. And then, for example, we are quite certain to use something on neutrality. Then you use helvetica, for example. Yep. Medium light, and then you have offline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got three categories. Yeah. So then you know exactly whether you use light, bold, medium, or offline. Yeah, 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 you do. It's it's a hard work on the beginning here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Cool. cool. Any more questions? No. <laughs> uh, just a simple question. How many? Uh, just from your experience for a particular website, how many font sizes do you recommend? The magic number. Everyone wants a magic <laughs> number. Yeah. Okay. So everyone has a different number, of course. My number comes from a, a gardener who recommends never have more than 11 types of plants in your garden. <laughs> 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 no, okay, so with, with typography, there are some basic rules how you can do it. So one is that if you are changing font, either don't change all three things at the same time, size, weight, and then either italic or not. Huh? Color, yeah, sorry. Size, weight, and color. So if you go, it creates scale up or down. You either make it bigger, but the same color and the same weight, or you make it the same size and then change the color, or same size and you change the weight. So if you try to apply everything at the weight same time, there's gonna be no harmony in it. So there are a couple of like design tricks on how to work with typography, and I am gonna prepare to talk about that. <laughs> Question, how do you scale your Do you use a consistent sort of ratio? Or yeah. Again, everyone has a magic number. <laughs> People are just addicted to numbers, it's amazing. Um, so there's the golden ratio, for example. There is the most commonly used, the ones that you have in your system, there's a reason why there is 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and so on and so forth. Um, again, it's a, it's a system that everyone creates themselves. It depends on the font that you choose. It depends on the light heights that you can afford. It is, there's a lot of things to do, but I think this comes with the experience and there are lots of articles you can learn about. But I will hold a talk about typography. <laughs> I swear. You are welcome. <laughs> okay. Uh, one note is here. So yeah? I just quickly skimmed SEO. Uh, again, the scheme. But I was applying a couple of months ago to mm -hmm. another uh, place. Uh -huh. and the SEO question was one of the key ones. Uh -huh. So actually, it's not recommended to use H1 in these cases, in both cases. Because SEO. All the engines are still uh, relying on H1, H2, down to H6. Mm -hmm. So it's recommended not to use uh, H1, for example, to control such methods. For the error. It might be yeah. different size. So CO does not care about the font size. So you yep. can use other thing, but uh, play in the side. But H1 is like, there is no magic. CO is not that smart to yep. recognize yeah, yeah. this. Thing. Absolutely. So, yeah, so now you're in the balance. SEO versus accessibility. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be user friendly or I'm going to be on the top of the page. If you're not targeting SEO, then that's fine. Yeah, but yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. It's supposed to be search searchable by SEO, then. It's a business uh, decision. Yeah, it's a business. yeah, it is business decision. Awesome. More? Uh, yeah, how do you guys approach your naming convention? So, for example, like, you do it by function, like, menu, I don't know, something like that. And for the screen, you get, like, sub menu. Yeah. Usually it's a team decision. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, we'll always have a joke that like naming is the hardest part of development. <laughs> um, in our current project, we usually name it based on um, directory-wise. We name it based on the module. Um, basically, what's the functionality of these components? Um, yeah. But that's is really different. to like the size of it, because for example, you might have a menu that might be different sizes depending on the menu. So um, it's always about. Um, so if you are thinking about naming, you you need to think about who's going to read that directory after you, right? like that namings after you. So you need to make sure that it is it gives you enough information to understand what this is, even without reading the code, just by reading the name. So it's just. Maybe a judgment call on you and your team to decide that. 
We do have a couple of unicorns inside of our code, though. <laughs> There's stuff that I call actually unicorn. Yeah. Okay, any more question? Yes. Can you go back to the slide where you show the typography? Yeah, and the one you So, uh, I see you define like style one and style two as two sort of presets in your typography class. Uh huh. So, um, how would you, like, and, and you, you have font weights which are, I'm guessing there are a couple of variations called medium, black, uh, and stuff like that. So, how would you, like you have five different, you have one atomic level of typography scaling and uh, typography elements and one when you have the presets. So how would you, um, how do you approach it actually? So you leave it up to the developers to um, pick and choose what preset they want for a particular use case or do you define everything as a predefined preset sort of in a typography class? As much as I love these guys, I would not give them that responsibility <laughs> and also put them into such a situation. Uh, you define that all. So from design perspective, these are all, each, each and individual one of these is defined by design. Um, and it's usually hard work. So for example, these actually in our last project, we only defined these in uh, iteration six. And imagine how much stories we have already played and how much deep into development we already went because only at that point we realized we have so many places where we need to accommodate and the fonts were just not working. So we had to redo, put all the screens next to each other and say, we have to scrap this, scrap this, change that, change that, and we came out with these styles. And we said, went to developers, please can you implement it for us <laughs> and refactor and make it happen. And but from that beautiful day, everything was then fast and easy. So, but yeah, it's something that you have to, yeah. As a designer, you have to define. Just an, uh, for an example case, uh, a, a label is, uh, let's say we're supposed to have font size uh, 12, uh, all caps. And same font style is supposed to be used, uh, same font size is supposed to be used for, let's say, a uh, footnote or something, mm -hmm. size 12, but not all caps, maybe different spacing. Mm -hmm. So would those go together as like one style preset? Different Separate. Separate. Functions. Yep. And you have to define this. Yes. Up, up front. You need to like that's that's the point. You never know everything up front, so you don't. And you name it as per the use case, so that developers will. You you agree on this. So we we've, we've called it style one, style two, style three, and then we we had the troubles because we had to remove style three, and suddenly we had style one, two, and four, five, six, seven, right? So like dinosaurs and tigers and mouse is highly recommended because it's not sequence. Uh, but it's, it has to be retrospectively, if anything. Yeah, yeah. Or at least I have never been able to predict future so that the styles I have defined on the beginning were actually the ones that went live. Mm -hmm. Cool. Recap. Just a quick one. So we are all employed, right? We work for some business. And we also need to make sure that we make an impact. And our work is actually then translating into some uh, tangible things for the business itself. And it's, some, it's always good to keep that on your mind. Um, so I've created amazing table for everyone to understand when you are creating scalable products, these are the things that are in it for you. So for a designer, when we implement grid, it means we are faster and we have consistent UI. Developers can be really, really fast with their development because they know exactly and fast, they don't have to do the measurements. And the code readability and the maintenance is much more easier. Business, they develop products faster. They have less errors, less bugs happening. For components, designers, we implement changes faster. I change it here, it changes everywhere. And the same is for product. Define patterns of use interaction. Next time I know there's gonna be a drop down or I know there's gonna be a, a model coming up, I already know how it's gonna behave. A simple, I already have, a, I'm building myself a reference library. For developers, reusability and maintenance of a code, simpler. Um, and this is the best thing for product. Changes to product are less costly, right? I have a component, I change it here, it happens everywhere. That's where the making sure that you are building real religion with your components actually pays off, literally pays off. Typography, I have a font system that I can go and reach out to. I know exactly how to use it, when to use it. For dev, speed and simple and cleaner code. And for business, it's about, I, I am actually creative as uh, assistive friendly um, technology. So this is it.
Any other questions? Can I just ask, hands up who came here for a, as a developer? Developers, hands up. OK. Hands up who is a designer? Hands up. I could have guessed so. Awesome. And who is here for product? OK. And who's the rest? <laughs> what, are, what are you, like BAs, PMs? You didn't raise your hand? Developer. Dev. OK, 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 OK. OK, awesome. Any other questions? <laughs> so linked to that, she has prepared something beautiful for you guys. Right, so we have prepared a sample code, which is actually our diabetes sign-up page, which is inspired by Google sign-up page. You can um, look for the code in GitHub. And there is also like a demo of this, uh, basically in uh, deployed in a Heroku app. So you can see inside the code base how we implement components, grid layout, implements uh, typography, and also as a bonus, there is also responsive design. So if you go to the GitHub page, you can see that uh, we actually implemented three different screens for different uh, sizes. Okay, the GIF is a bit lagging, but yeah. So they are uh, responsive back into that, and we also put a style guide for developer inside that you can play around with and see how uh, it's basically set up. The hmm. Cool. That's it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. How do we turn this off? I think you just you pull it off. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs>